my junk or was that the that's one of them you had to go like four miles an hour to get it to work no, it or something fine. like that it was okay i got some good pictures with it i got some stuff at bussy that'll blow your mind really i got some stuff at bussy that'll blow your mind Oh, we, I'm sorry. No, no, y'all good. We're, we're rolling with it, son. I got some stuff at Bussy to blow your mind. I'll tell you what, when I first went out there, after they reflooded it, everybody's fishing the pad li- li- right. edges. And I was side imaging, and I got some pictures of it. And I was, like, driving, and I was like, what is that? And it's bulldozer tracks. Hmm. Really? And I said, all right, so it's a little muddier right here. So we're looking at aerial photos, and I'm looking at the aerial photos. They didn't have nothing. I was like, well, it's a definite area. You can see the mud. So I started following these bulldozer tracks. I said, they're pushing something, and it's pushing brush. And I found brush piles, like, just out out, out, out in the middle. Really? And sit right there. Yeah, I can go to them right now. You can go right to it, and they'll be gang, bass ganged up on them. That's crazy. All right, boys and girls, we are rolling. I got Mr. Tyler Stewart with me. We're going to let everyone introduce themselves here in just a second. But to my left, we got Nick Joyner. Him and Tyler, I'll let y'all tell y'all's story. We'll be quick with that because we want to get to the live scope, to the good stuff. Yeah, let's get and, to uh, it. So anyhow, we'll do a little quick introduction really quick. Nick, tell us who you are, what you do in fishing, what you've done in fishing, and then we'll kind of go around the room. Yep, so my name is Nick Joyner. Uh, I'm essentially just what you call a washed-up college fisherman. <laughs> Didn't do much with it after <laughs> that, but uh, we had a good run with it, won some championships, and uh, gained a lot of experience. And uh, – me and Tyler, we've been friends for I don't know how long. It's been a long time. Since probably 2010, maybe Pro- even before that. Probably I know we so. graduated high school in 2013, so a few we years were friends before that. way before that. Yeah, so we started fishing ponds together, and uh, his dad would wake us up at, what, 2 a.m., and we would go to Fork and then <laughs> yeah. do like a day trip. Yeah. And so that started our fishing career together. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I mean, we used to tear the ponds up. It didn't matter how we had to get there. We would we would be driving. We'd be riding bicycles down Well Road with tackle boxes <laughs> and fishing and rods, going to random people's ponds, <laughs> knocking on everybody's door. We got a lot of no's, but uh, there was this one guy. You remember the guy in the wheelchair? Oh yeah, yeah. He run us <laughs> off every time we tried to fish West Lakes. Every time. Yeah, we finally gave him some worms. And <laughs> yeah, and then he started, started letting fish. fish. What what is a no? Do what? What is a no? What do you mean? You you had to ask permission to get no. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. well we didn't ask permission. He came down there and told us we needed to leave. <laughs> Better to ask forgiveness than yeah. permission is what that's they right. say. Yep. So, uh, all right, Tyler. Uh, what's up? I'm Tyler Stewart. Um, been fishing for pro now for uh, seven years. Started out fishing in high school, and uh, me and Nick fished four years in college. Like he said, uh, we had some pretty good success in that, and then. Um, you know, in 2018, I decided to make the jump and fish the uh, in the FLW tour. Got to do that for two years before they, uh, you know, MLF bought us out. And uh, been fishing that for, you know, I think six years since. And uh, it's been good. Had a lot of fun. Actually, next week, about to start uh, my either eighth or ninth season. So looking forward to getting out there and doing that. Nice. Garmin Guru. Yeah, I, what's I happening? Got, I don't got no good stories about fishing the tour now, dude. You are from a little small hole in the wall place called Bastrop, yeah. Louisiana. That's right. That's right. And you have twenty, thirty thousand, twenty-five thousand, something like that subs on YouTube. I got that many. I got thirty thousand on Facebook. We got a page on that too. Nice. So, yeah, it's got, just kind of started a page. I get I get so tired of when you go on Facebook and or YouTube and you see everybody, they always hate on everybody. Somebody yeah. asks a simple question, and they're just rude. Yeah, <clears throat> and so I started a page and YouTube where, you know, if you ask questions, no matter how it is, no rudeness. Yep. Just answer the question. Yep. And it, and it, I started small. I think I had like five hundred subscribers, and then it's got up to almost thirty thousand. So it's, it's got to be really big. I've been all over the country. I've been to, up in Missouri, Alabama, Texas, down south, and go do lessons and seminars and stuff on the live scope, and it's. I just found my niche. I'm going to let them catch the fish. <laughs> I'm going to find my niche well, doing that. So so I was down at Spotted Dog. This was like two years ago. Okay. And when did I get all my life? When did I get a boat for life scope stuff? Uh, 
two-ish years ago? Yeah, around two years ago. So a year and a half, two years ago, and I was down at Spotted Dog, and I was getting all the Garmin stuff. I mean, they were sold out, and it was right after COVID. It's hard to get stuff. And I was like, this is what I want to put on my boat. And so it was, wait, it was right before or right after the LVS 34 came out. And I was talking to Michael. I'm like, dude, there's this guy called Garmin Guru. You need to look at him because Michael's looking back into getting a boat and that kind of stuff. And I was like, you need to check him out. I was, and I mean, no disrespect. This is the most respect I could possibly give you. <laughs> I said, he's like live scope for dummies. And that's that's what it is. Like most people that hate live scope, which we're going to talk about everything. But most people, I think, in the comments that I see of people hating live scope is because they, they're like me and they don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm two years in and I've watched every one of your videos more times than I can count. <laughs> that, that's where your 30,000 subs come from is for me <laughs> as many as, as I've watched them. But it's it's. I don't know. We'll get to all that later, but your uh, channel is very helpful. And I got one video that that it's kind of it's got about a hundred thousand views. It's it's the live scope master master class, like two hours long, where I literally went through every single step, explained what it was, how to set it up, and it's the one that I could stop putting videos out tomorrow, and it'll I'll still get ten thousand views a month on it. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's unreal. Yeah, it's good. So. Uh, as y'all, everyone knows, we are here to talk about live scope. It is a very hot topic, and it has been forever. I mean, how long has live scope been out? Seven years. Seven. Nine. Yeah. Okay. Twenty sixteen. It's gotten really popular, probably in the last four years. But yeah, yeah. There was a couple guys, you know, taking advantage of it before everybody knew it was going on. Were you one of those guys? No, unfortunately, I wasn't. But there was a couple guys that, you know, ran Garmin's that that had a leg up on competition that we're not mentioning it at all so yeah you could thank davy height for that <laughs> and patrick walters yeah and, and and covid when all those three things came together is when it became a deal yeah um matter of fact I, that's when i bought it because you couldn't do nothing you couldn't do nothing and we was watching patrick walters on fork and when they moved that tournament to the fall it was the perfect storm for welcome to live scope because he sat right there and uh and that's what he that's all he did yeah and Davy Height said I can remember Davy Height having that interview he said told him he said I gotta let it out of the bag he was like please wait to the last day please and he begged him to wait to like the last day or two to say something about what he was doing and I can remember on Monday I saw every bit of the hummingbird I had and on Tuesday I went in debt with uh Garmin. the bass tank and bought all my Garmin stuff nice nice yeah. so that's how it started for me at least yeah you know. Yep, so uh, I run Garmin on all my boat. Turn yeah. your mic towards your mouth just a little bit. Just tilt it up. Right there? Tilt right. it Yep, there you go. Got it. Yeah, there we go. So I run Garmin on my boat. You run Garmin, and I, I think you've tried them. You've tried them all, but you're currently using Garmin. I'm currently using Garmin, and we have two Lowrance guys right here. Yep. And uh, so we're going to do our best to call it uh, forward-facing sonar, but we're – I'm gonna slip up and call it live scope, but when we do, I'm definitely meaning <laughs> I'm definitely meaning active target. I'm meaning all that. We're talking about forward facing sonar. Absolutely. But, yeah. So uh Slade, one of the guys that that helps out with a lot of stuff at Spotted Dog, he came by earlier and he said, I really want to know something. Before everything gets kicked off, I really want to know, do you hook your live scope, your black box, your active active targets, do you hook run all that off your cranking battery or do you run it off a lithium battery? So for me, I've got the my battery set up, so I've got just an AGM I run my cranking on. I run cranking, live wells, all that on just an AGM. And then I've got a, secu- a separate 12-volt, 120-amp-hour um, lithium that I run for all my units, including live scope, or uh, I guess you would call it active target and the box. Everything's on that one battery. And then I've got two 36-volt lithiums I run for my trolling. So I pretty much pull all my, you know, graph power off of one, you know, one battery. And I haven't had any issues doing that. Um, You know, I know you do something a little different, but in the past, what I would run into is, um, I don't know how Garmin is, but Active Target, you know, if your power's on, that live scope, you can turn it off, but you have to manually turn it off. And your, you know, it would run your battery down. And I got stranded a couple times, you know, uh, you know, trying to scope fish all day and then, uh, not even cranking my motor and then the end of the day go to crank up and then you know it wouldn't crank so for me i think the separate battery is really useful but um i don't think it's completely necessary for everybody yeah right well i do a little bit different um but what he says you know it has a parasitic draw that box is always slightly drawing 
It's not much. Uh, and if you don't have your batteries on charge and you put it outside and you don't have a disconnect switch to that black box, come back out there and try to go live scope one day. You'll turn it on and it'll say source not found. Mm -hmm. But I do mind – I believe what he says, though, because, you know, when they first came out, they were really, really bad about getting interference. Now, the, the Active Target 2, I think, and the LVS-34 are much, much better with interference problems. They don't seem to have that – uh, where if you breathe hard, you get interference on the screen. They've they've solved those, in my opinion. Right. No I don't doubt. know if you've seen that, too. Yeah. They're much better. Um, I don't think they knew what they had when they invented this thing. I, I don't think they knew what they had uh, when they, it was like the PS20. I don't think they knew that it was going to go this far. But I have, uh, you know, cranking battery lithium, and then I have another battery just for my electronics. Now, they're running parallel. But I think the most important thing, and, and you might contest this, is having a good dedicated wire to wherever you run to. I run mine to a fuse box up front, and then I put all my units and black boxes run into that fuse box. Don't piggyback off of, say, your, your running lights or, you yeah. know, or your trolling motor. Don't do that. Yeah. You want to have good a good, clean power wire that runs back to those batteries. And then you'll find, like I said, I don't find it as much with the newer ones having interference, but when you had that, the LVS-32 and the Active Target 1, if the live well kicked on, you'd see the fuzz on the screen. I don't see that as much with the newer models, but dedicated power wires is a must. The only know. the only time I ever see any, fer any interference anymore is if I'm close to someone else that's live scoping and their Absolutely. ping is kind of facing me. I don't know if it matters what unit you're using. I think you're going to get some interference, you know, Definitely around other live scopers. I think that's a, that's a frequency thing, you yeah. know, because they, no matter who it is, live scope, um, you know, active target, hummingbird, they're running on mega. It's mega imaging, right? And and so you'll see that pulse come across the right. screen. You can you can fix that somewhat if you get into an area where two guys are fixing, go into your noise rejection, kick it up to high. And it'll eliminate that. Okay. But there's a byproduct to that. You're going to see a slower return because it's filtering more. So it kind of goes what I look like, what I compare it to is it looks like it's in molasses. The You know, the bait's coming back. Right. It looks like it's in molasses. The fish are in molasses because that black box is working extremely hard to filter out the noise. Right. And so everything kind of goes into slow motion. But I want to say this. I think – at times, I, you know, filtering is going to fill. It doesn't know what it's filtering. It may filter out the bait, <laughs> plankton in the water, right. trash. It doesn't know. It just filters what you tell it to filter to whatever strength. Right. But that's not always a bad thing. Some people, I've noticed that this, let's say you're working a jerk bait. You see a fish come up, hit it. You jerk it out of their mouth because you see it. Right. For years and years, we have we felt the bite and then set the hook. Now we're seeing the bite. Right. Mm -hmm. So you jerk it out of their, their mouth. Right. How many times have we done that? So yeah. what I've learned, so what I've learned, this is kind of, if you turn up, say, to medium or even a higher, uh, you know, noise rejection, it puts a delay into your bait. Right. And sometimes, so if you find yourself jerking away, turn it up a little bit, and it puts a slight delay. And by the time you see him hit, He's actually got the bait. You'll keep yourself from jerking away. So if you ever get in that problem where you're yeah. antsy, and I can see yourself in a tournament where you're jacked up yeah. and you're jerking it away, turn up your noise rejection a little bit, and well, it'll I slow down the return. Then you'll go, oh, he's got it. Well, he had it because yeah. it's mm -hmm. a second behind. For me, when I see him coming, I just turn away. <laughs> I don't even look anymore <laughs> because I have pulled it out of so many of them's mouth that I just, like, they swim up to it, and uh, okay. I think they got it, and – Pull and sure enough, you know, I start catching a lot more when they start coming, and I just don't even look at the screen anymore. Just turn away or just look forward or whatever, and just wait. So I have a bad. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Especially when they eat that glide, they come oh. so hard at Boy. that thing, <laughs> and and you like it's so hard not to pull that thing out of their mouth, but you have to wait. It's like frog fishing. Like that's the only thing you can compare it to. Like you, when one eats it, you like have to like let it sit there, but. On the, I mean, on the the glide, you know, if you see one coming and and it looks like they are already, they've already eaten that thing, but a lot of times they run up to it, you know, and don't get it right away. So you just have to wait until you feel it and then just, you know, reel down and crack them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, with the fish that y'all catch and and you too, the I fish mean. that these guys catch, not me. A lot, a lot of times my bait is bigger than the fish that I'm catching, but. <laughs> 
Yeah, I would get a little bit nervous, too. I'd have to have that noise reject on extra, extra high. <laughs> Whoever made one, I don't care who it is, I'd have to I'd have to get their unit to get that extra high noise reject. You know, what's crazy to me, forward-facing sonar has taught me so much. Like, you know, everybody's always said, you know, there's no fish just out there swimming around in the middle. Like, you don't <laughs> catch them out there. You can go put your boat in at Caney right now and put your trolling motor down and just go out there and 30, 40 foot of water, it don't matter what depth, in the middle of the lake, and you're going to see bass swimming around. And those, believe it or not, are just as easy to catch, you know, if not easier than the ones that are on the bank or under docks or in brush. I mean, it's crazy, you know, how much it's opened up, you know, as far as people, you know, the way people fish. And, uh, you know, learning how to catch them, too, is just another thing. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have any little tips on that? Uh, for me, it took me a long time to realize, like, used to, when I, when, I, when I first started doing it, I would get the bait too close to them or mm -hmm. let it get under them or do something like that. But what I have learned is to use the lightest weight I can get away with and try to keep that bait at least two or three feet above their head, like if they're suspended, just swimming around. And then once they start exerting energy, like towards your bait, do not stop it because if you stop it, they are not going to eat it. They're going to swim up to it and turn around. You have to try to get that thing away from them. And once you figure that out, you will catch way more fish because everybody's always like, oh, they're falling it, but they won't eat it. Yeah, well, if you stop that bait in front of them, they're not going to eat it, which is weird because, like, we've always, like, when you're cranking and stuff, like, there's been so many times where you're cranking and then you just stop and one eats it. But mm -hmm. when you're scoping, I don't know why. I don't know if it has something to do with the suspended, you know, fishing for suspended fish or what, but – if that bait, if they get too good of a look at it, they will not eat it for me. Well, I think I think what you're talking about in cranking is you're coming through cover or you're right. bouncing off the bottom. Yeah. They're not getting that vision. And when they're, they're, they're seeing, they're looking, they're looking, and then it pops up because you freeze it, boom, they get right. it. When you're in open water, they're watching it the whole time. Right. So they're watching and they're learning. They're learning. They don't got brains the size of a pea. But they're learning. The whole time they're watching it, they're following it, they're learning it. And when you kill it, it nothing just stops. Fish right. don't stop swimming. Uh, crankbait, you're deflecting or you're changing the motion of it. I think it's more of a reaction. But when they're right. eating a live scope bait, whether it be an A-rig, a glide bait, a big swim bait, or the new little hover things that they, they throw, they're eating. And so they're looking for something alive. But they're also in open water, just like me and you. And they're looking. You get a you get a deer in a field. Yeah. Get a deer in a field. I mean, he's always looking and learning. But you get him in the woods, you can get away with stuff because he's mm -hmm. walking behind a right. tree. Mm -hmm. He he never gets a clear view of you. But you get him in a field, he gets a clear view. So what he's doing. So you've got to keep ahead of him as they come. I like I speed it up a little oh, bit. Oh, absolutely. Keep going. Keep increasing the speed. And it's almost like playing keep away from a child. Mm -hmm. You get it to the point where I just got to have it. I gotta have that it. fish can swim faster than you can reel your bait oh in. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! Unreal. Another yeah. thing too, like for me, like I'm, I catch like the singles and stuff. But if you can find like two or three grouped yes. up swimming around, mm -hmm. and you can just get one to come up and look at it, yeah. most of the time they're gonna get real. The other two are gonna get aggressive, and one's gonna get it every single time. Be a frenzy. Well, I think it, it comes up a competition. Uh, it, they see each other, and they're you know, it's kind of like, you know, you see two kids, you throw a toy on the ground. It's like one kid by itself, you look at it. If another kid grabs it, they all want it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they create that schooling. But here's one thing that I have done, and, and I don't know if you see it. When I'm out there fishing for fish, I like the ones that don't move. He's just sitting there. That's yeah. the ones I could catch better than any of them. The ones that are roaming, they're hard to get on. Because you just as soon as you get the bait to them, they don't swim 12 feet over here. But what I have found is I throw one maybe two times if they don't bite i hit the waypoint button and i go i keep going i'm not gonna spend an hour on one fish i don't now some people may but i'll mark it and then i'll go up and i'll come back to them later on uh I, and I, a good example is that lake fork we were, i was giving a lesson to a guy and it was they were spawning but it was a severe cold front and all the fish moved right to the channel they, and when i say move to the channel i mean every spawning female went to the channel and I was showing the guy how to do, you know, get in his live scope. And I said, look, man, you want to catch some? There's a big one on that stump right there. And, uh, and, and I mean, we found several of them. 
And he said, how many times you throw? I said, throw two times. One time, two times. If he don't come, she's just not in the mood. But come back an hour, her mood will change. You know, we all got women. <laughs> come back an hour, their mood will change. My wife's going to kill me for that one. <laughs> but I threw up there. He said, no, you do it. So I threw up there. He didn't bite. It was, and it was a big one. We went to another stump, and I threw up there. First cast called a nine-pounder. And we let it go. And I said, you ain't going to believe this. There's another one down there. I said, throw. He's like, no, I don't want to mess it up. I was like, whatever. <laughs> Eight pounder, caught it, let it go, and threw back on the same stump. There was a seven pounder, caught it too, and uh, we went back to the first big fish. She wouldn't bite again. Well, I went on to another lesson. I had another guy on the other side of the lake. He calls me. He's like, "Man, I got it." I was like, "You got? You figured it out?" He's like, "No, I caught the fish." I was like, "What do you mean?" He said, "I went back to that waypoint five times, and on the fifth time, I threw up there, and she come off there like a rabid dog." <laughs> Boom. I, but he. He, the fish never moved, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it finally hit that active period, and he knew where she was, and he just kept rechecking. One cast. He said, I'd make a cast. She wouldn't bite a comeback. He said, after that, when I come back that next time, it's like she had never seen a bait. So a lot of times I'll mark them and come back. Now, this ain't for – this This could be a little bit – if you're a tournament guy, this may not be your thing, you know, because yeah. you need to put some fish in the boat. Mm -hmm. So fishing how you may fish – for fun may not equate over to tournament fishing, but it could equate to maybe kicking that big kicker fish or right. something like that. Yeah. You know, we're talking about bass, but kicking right back to uh crappie. Mike, when we were at your house earlier, that's what Mike said. He just got back from Caney and caught several real, I mean, caught a good mess of slabs. And, uh, and he said that he would go and he'd fish them. And that, you know, I ain't telling about Mike, but I believed him on this. <laughs> he said that he went and he fished them. Fish, this is like a 200 fish, just this big just school. And he went and he caught a few off of it, and they'd stop biting. And he said he'd leave and come back 15, 20 minutes later. He'd catch a few more, and they'd just stop. They wouldn't even look at it. No matter what color jig, what he threw, he'd come back 10, 15, 20 minutes later, hit them back up again. And so there's there's something there's something to that waiting, waiting. Which I know that's a little bit different story than what you're talking about with the well, fish. They but. definitely got feeding frenzies or you know feeding yeah. times anyway. Yeah. I mean, there. If you, as much like idling and graphing as I do, like just even around here, like there's places that like, and they do it sometimes like the same exact time every single day. Like I got a lot on Caney, and then like I got places where they'll show up at daylight, pull up and catch them, and I got places they don't get till ten o'clock. And when I say get, like group up and actually be, you know, feeding. I mean, you might graph over in the morning, see one or two, but you come back at like eight thirty, nine o'clock, and there'll be twenty there. So it's it's crazy too, and it's what's weird to me is like how smart they do have little brains, but they go back to the same places mm. every single year. Like, I mean, I rarely ever find a new school, and I'm always looking. It's like the same couple places all over and over and over again. And uh, I got a story that's crazy. So I fished a little afternoon tournament one time two years ago, and uh, pulled up on the spot. Nick knows the spot, and. Uh, I I'm hoping up. I know this spot before it's <laughs> over with. <laughs> so I pull up and I catch a nine pounder. Well, this fish is missing half his tail, has a giant hole in his lip where somebody weighed him. Like there's no like, n like not recognizing this fish. So that Thursday I weigh that fish in, weighs like 9.2 or something. Throw him back at the marina. The next Thursday, that, that spot was like two miles from there. The next Thursday I pull up on that spot and catch that same fish again a week from that day. I mean, he was swam right back to it. That's what's crazy. I mean, wow. obviously, if they didn't, there would be more bass right there in front of the spillway than anywhere in every lake that they have a bunch of tournaments out of. But mm -hmm. it's crazy. Like, even, like, at Rayburn, all those tournaments get one around the canyons, Bird Island, all that stuff. But oh, all yeah. most of the tournaments are out of um, the pavilion. You would think that – What's all, that, 20 miles? Yeah. I mean, you would think that, like – as many tournaments as they have on Rayburn, you would think you'd go right out in front of the boat ramp and just mash on them, but you don't. It's just crazy. I don't know. I think they all swim back. They make the, bass. Yeah, they are. I swear. I mean, I don't know I if think, you, you I think agree there's with probably that. A, there's about a week period that they probably, you know, I always find two or three, four days. They, they, they get back out there and they acclimate, and then they're gone. You remember the Ronald McDonald at the, when they used to do it out there at Lazar Point, Washtenaw yeah. River? Mm -hmm. For that week – Right after, oh that, yeah, you could go to that right there, right there, and just mash them. Yeah, mm -hmm. mash. Them. Then it was gone. It was over. But I think they just reacclimate themselves to work. Uh, but I could definitely say. But to me, let me ask you about this. I, 
you know, everybody always says, <clears throat> this is something life coach taught me. You know, when, when it's, it's winter time. They're going out there to the main lake. I, I don't know if that's as true as we always thought it was, that they all migrate. You know, that, and yeah. if you listen to people, I mean, it's like they all got on a bus and went to the main lake. I fish at Lake Fork a lot. I love it. Right. And I fish up Little Caney. That's yep. my favorite favorite arm. I don't know why. I just love it. I, I always go to that arm. And I've probably been 10 times in the last year. And I, I bet you I burned $5 worth of gas. And that's just to back it off the trailer. And I put the live scope down, and I catch them. With, I mean, I can see the boat ramp. Yeah. And that's not the main lake's two miles out there. Right. And you catch them. My thought was, what's the difference in 30 foot of water <laughs> right there and 30 foot on the main lake? Now, I'm not saying that fish don't as a whole. Right. But I think ever and you'll look out on the main lake, be 150 boats out there. I'll be the only person in the lake and still catching big ones. I think that, like, uh, I don't think all of them move. Like, I think you're always going to have fish that stay in certain creeks or migrate into creeks. I mean, like in the fall, most mm -hmm. of the shad push back in the backs of creeks. I think, like, all these creeks in the fall get, like, a big push of fish. Well, in the winter, I think, you know, a lot of that bait goes back out, and a lot of them fish will stay. But as far as, like, a, you know, like a huge, like the wave, uh, for me personally, I don't think it has to be the dam or the main lake. I just think it has to be near deep water right. where the bait's at. Right. And, uh, I mean, I see it all the time. Like, I see fish, like, uh, you know, I keep referencing Caney because I spend so much time out <coughs> there. But, like, the, uh, you know, one week the bait might be in the middle, middle of the lake, and they might stay there for two weeks, you know. And then, you know, you go back out there, and you don't see any bait, any fish, anything. And then you go 100 yards down the lake, and there they are. There's all the fish. There's all the bait everything and i just think they're just following bait you know wherever i don't think all of them do but i think the masses do yeah yeah well, well i always got taught there was three kinds of fish and especially when it's shallow medium and deep there's the fish that i mean this is no joke i i caught i've caught fish on lake fork in 43 degree water temperature in two foot yep be up on brim beds eating yeah, eating up it. on brim beds and that's a whole nother subject we're gonna talk about perspective but we need to talk about that a whole nother day because that's a whole <laughs> different <day. laughs> But there's fish that stay shallow, fish that, you know, stay deep, and then there's the fish that migrate back and forth. The, yep. the traditional, okay, it's got cold, so they pull it out. There's the fish, oh, it's got warm, so they pull it in. But I think there's like three different kinds of fish. Some of them just different. They're yep. just mm -hmm. different. Yep, I can agree with that for sure. You know, for me, like in the multi-day tournaments, when we got 150 guys, there's a lot of the, – the bank gets beat to death. And we have to make our, you know, make our our patterns last for three to four days. So for me, like I always try to find those fish off the bank a little bit, you know, where there might be more coming or moving in or whatever. But um, but I think you know you got guys like John Cox who never even turn their graph on that win all the time. But uh, for me, I just think it's easy, you know, it's easier for me to catch those fish off the bank. And for, for, for probably for you, too. I mean, someone who's spent, all, you know, a decent amount of time with not just forward-facing sonar, but just, you know, side scan, down scan. I mean, you, you just – you can go look for them and find them. And, and when you do find them, they're just more acclimated to catch them than, you know, going down the bank with a spinnerbait. Or a watermelon red brush hog. Yeah. I just got through telling you. Better some, shut your mouth. I done caught a lot of fish on that bait now. <laughs> Dude, hey, look, bro, I have two. I absolutely have two, but – it's kind of going another little topic that is pretty hot right now and not trying to get too controversial, but I'm not that great of a fisherman. I like to think that I am, and I really enjoy it, but I'm staying up close to the bank or some kind of structure unless I have that forward-facing sonar. If I don't have it, I'm, even if I have maps, it's very difficult for me to catch fish without a forward-facing sonar, and that's just because of my lack of ability to know what to do or just – being ignorant to fishing a little bit. And I feel like you, I'm going to use, use you as an example. You fish forever. I mean, all y'all have. Y'all yeah. fish forever not using forward-facing sonar, and so you know how to fish. And now that you implement that extra tool, that's, that's the icing on the cake. And so kind of going into the next little topic, what are your thoughts on – Everybody's saying they want to ban live scope. They want to, you know, make it. You go to it's a federal offense to to even say the the name live scope or something <laughs> like that. But that's what they say. 
this is just my thought. Y'all tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that it takes two different skills. I'm not saying you can't have both, but it's two different skills to know how to use forward facing sonar and how to catch fish on the level that y'all do versus cutting it off, going out there and just catching fish. I mean, me personally, I think whether you have live scope or forward facing sonar, the same guys are going to catch them either way. You take that away, your same guys are going to probably catch them. Same guys are going to win. Same guys are going to cut checks. I think the guys that hate it are the guys that haven't really spent time with it. Because it's, I mean, it's not something that you can just plug in your boat and just go right. figure out how to do it. I mean, it takes some time messing with it and stuff. And, I mean, I use it a lot. I mean, a ton. But there's probably in the last three years only been maybe a handful of tournaments that it's really helped me. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to do it in every single tournament. Um, and there's just so many other ways to catch fish. I mean, I don't see it going anywhere. I mean, Lawrence, Garmin, Humminbird, all these companies that are, you know, putting it out are big sponsors of our leagues, and they're not going to ban technology that they spend a trillion dollars on make it. So that's just how I feel about it. My, my thought is this, and I, boy, I, this is one of my things. I think the people that dislike it, and it tends to be some of the – the 40 year olds it seems to be the older crowd it's first of all it's because they it, it's a it's a new frontier it's something new uh, going down the bank is easy mm-hmm. it's it's that's just what you do you do target fishing when it's on there's nothing more fun than target fishing i mean throw a spinnerbait on a tree and watch it come off of there <laughs> i get you shook up yeah but i think in my personal opinion and, and the people that don't like it there's kind of two reasons and it goes to the tournament trails I think it's because some of their heroes are irrelevant now because of it. You know, when you're growing up and Kevin Van Dam is your guy, you know, Roland Martin is your guy, Hank Parker is your guy. I mean, Hank, Kevin Van Dam is, he's the best. Right. But he didn't, develop, even the tournaments that he won and the tournaments that he did good in, he didn't use forward facing sonar that much. Right. And they were his tournaments to actually use them. And my gosh, if he would have just used them, he would have blew them out. Wheeler, you give him 10 more minutes and Wheeler would have caught him on his last victory because Wheeler was coming. He -hmm. found them. And I think it's because it's making their heroes irrelevant. Their their guys, oh, he found the fish. You know, he was now, you know, he he used his brain. But I don't think that they're taking into effect that, for example, when Kevin Van Dam won on Toledo Bend, he may not have been staring at his screen for a live scope. But he was staring at his screen, if you watch that, for a waypoint and looking at his maps. The technology he used was no different. He's using yeah. a technology. And so it's making some of their heroes irrelevant. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and, and it's being irrelevant is, and when I say irrelevant, Kevin Down is always relevant. Roland Martin is always relevant. But I'm talking about in terms of where they finish in tournaments. They're not as up there in the finishes anymore. It's because they haven't adapted to the new t- new deals, and 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 when you don't adapt, you're gonna get blown away. Yeah. And then the second thing that I think people gripe about, they say it makes a tournament boring. Well, when we first started watching Bassmaster, I know it's 45 minute show, created drama. I mean that battle on the border down there, at Lake Falcon and Lake Amistad. Wait, I mean they was about to fist fight in the boat. They were not about to fist fight. Right. They created drama into a 45-minute show, and it made you watch it. You watch for the drama as much as you did the fishing. Now, they've got eight hours of coverage, 10 hours of coverage every day. And let me tell you something. Bass fishing is boring if you watch it for 10 hours a day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, what, they've been staring at screens at smallmouth waters forever. You've been watching 2D sonar, uh, white perch fishing, crappie fishing, whatever you want to call it. You've been staring at the screen forever. But now, when you watch it for 10 hours, that's what you, that's boring. Well, it's got to be the live scope. It's been like that boring forever. It's just that people want instant gratification now. And when you get instant gratification, you got to watch 10 hours and you watch them catch. I mean, they're all the time. You, I mean, they sit there for 25 minutes, and what does Bassmaster do? They show past fish catches from the day before because nothing's happening. Mm-hmm. And so that's what's happening. It's more coverage. They're a, they're kind of a victim of their own success. The more you wanted more, 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 more. Now you get more, and you're yeah. like, well, this is boring. Well, yeah, it's boring because they took four days of bass fishing and put it into 45 minutes and made the best shows ever. Now you're taking four days of bass fishing, putting it into 40 hours of coverage, 
and it is boring. Yeah. I may be different, but personally, I love watching people catch them on the scope. When mm-hmm. I say boring, Same you here. know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm just saying like the general public, they look, they say it's boring and it's not fun to watch, but to see, you know, people using that new technology, you know, doing something a little extra, you know, to make those fish bite or, or doing whatever, that's just cool to me. Like it's different, you know, no, this is new, you know, and, uh, I mean, Nick can attest to it. Well, we fished a tournament last year, and I, I don't know if Nick had caught one on the live scope yet or might have caught a couple, but we pulled up to a brush pile, and this thing was in, like, 30 foot. Like, I never catch them that deep. And we threw that glide over it, and an, what was, like, a nine-pounder mm-hmm. come out and ate that glide. I just held and the then, net just, like, <laughs> watched a master at work because it was the craziest thing I've ever seen. And uh, I was just amazed at it. You know, that was probably one of the most fun things I've ever watched. And I've watched, you know, people catch double digits off of beds. And yeah. that, in my opinion, was more fun to watch. Within a week, Nick had a Nick had an active target. <laughs> Within a week, he was like, I don't care what I got to do. I'm going to get an active target. And then I went over to his house. And we, <laughs> we cut a big old giant hole in his little boat. <laughs> and we put one on there. And, uh yeah, I mean, I think he's gotten good at it now. He sent me pictures of big fish he's caught on it. And stuff, yeah, I don't so. like fishing with him. Oh, it's not fun for the person that's behind. You that, know, that's, that's, all, that's I don't, another thing. I don't like fishing mm-hmm. beside him. We'll get on the front of my boat or the front <laughs> of his, and he's he knows more about it than I do. And we're sitting there, and I'm like, what are what are we looking at? And so I'm still in that little stage of trying to figure it all out. But, yeah, yeah. When, when you know how to use it, you, you can catch fish, but it sounds like it's a lot of different variables from what everyone thinks. The reason that people hate live scope, it's not just one thing, but you have people that love it or people that hate it. And it sounds like there's, well, there's many not a lot variables. of middle ground. Yeah. There's no, not a lot there, of middle ground. No, You're I either on the fence or, but here's the thing with that. This is what I say. And, and this is, this is where we're running into a problem as fishing community as a whole. We're fishing. Okay. We got there are 300 million Americans wanting to take away fishing and hunting and everything we do. That's all they want to do is take it away from us, okay? If it was up to them, we'd just be all at the bar drinking and sipping and cat. I'm not that guy, okay? We don't. I like to fish and hunt. We like to do those things, and now we're becoming our own worst enemies. Fishermen are fighting each other mm-hmm. because they don't think. If you want to fish with live scope and you want to go down the bank, hey, do it. Hey, waving each other on the way by. You're not even fishing for the same fish. Yeah. You ought to be happy that the guy's fishing in the middle because that's half the fish is normal because 10 years ago, we was all, you know, you'd just be yeah. you'd be right down yeah. the boat behind each other and you're trying to figure out something different, and it's hard. Yeah. And it's whoever got to the first, the five trees that they that they bit on first. I don't, we need to stop fighting. If somebody wants to live scope, let them do it. Leave it alone. I don't think it's hurting fish populations in terms of bass. Bass is mostly a catch and release thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, white perch, could it? Possibly. It could. because. But here's the thing. I think what hurts white perch fishing or any fishing as a whole is, and it's like duck hunting. You know, it's, it's six possession or six a day, but 12 possession. In reality, that means you ain't supposed to kill no more ducks than 12. Or, right. or if you got 25, pos- 25 daily creel white perch, 20, 50 possession, you're supposed to stop at 50. But, you know, people go out there catch 25 for 30 days no. in a row. So Even before, up. you know, Fort Face and Sonar, though, they, I mean, there were so many guys going out there oh, yeah. and just loading the boat with crappie, and, you know, and they, they ain't going to stop. They're, so maybe they need to adjust, you know, maybe you need to adjust the limits in terms of that. And so when you do that, the guy's going to go out there and say, look, like a Darbon, right? Mm-hmm. You only keep seven, which just happens to be the tournament limit over, right. over a certain right. limit. So – you know, you've adjusted that limit where you're they're not keeping 25 giants. You only keep seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And but I even see this now, catching, f- release fishing and crappie is becoming a bigger deal. People are starting to let some of the shoot. Big not ones for go. me, son. <laughs> not <laughs> not, not everybody, yeah. but they're starting to let them go. You know, you yeah. s- when you and you start to choose a better size. You know, I I want to eat the 10 or 12 inches. That's the one. You know, that's the ones I want to eat. They the best ones. You know, and you get that three pounder. It's it's beautiful fish. Let, I let it go. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna let it go. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, so, you know, you got your live scope unit. You've decided what side of the fence you're gonna go on. Right. And uh, like Tyler said, I've only had mine for roughly a year now, actually a little less than that. So I have very little time behind it. 
you've got your you know your power running good from your lithium battery it's running crisp but i get out there i drop my trolling motor and yeah i kind of know what some bass look like i kind of understand what some crappie look like but what am i looking at how do i differentiate and id certain wow. fish that's this is a good question it may be i haven't used the lorentz as much because i bought it and i didn't really like it so i got rid of it pretty quickly for Lowrance, maybe different than uh, yeah. garment. Why don't you tell me? Tell me what do you? How do you differentiate between a Lowrance bass and a crappie? Uh, how do you? Or do even that? a trash fish. Yeah. So for me, like uh, you know, you see gar and carp and stuff all the time. Catfish on the Lowrance, it seems like when you see like a carp or a catfish, they're almost hollow. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can almost see like the air pocket in their stomach or something. It's not like a you don't get as hard a return. You get more of a fuzzy return. Hmm. And, uh, you know, if you're on a lake where there's giant bass, you know, eight, 10 pound bass, mm -hmm. and there's, you know, catfish everywhere too, it is hard to kind of differentiate which, which is which. But for me, the bass just give a harder return, a brighter return. When I say harder, I mean a brighter return. Okay. And, um, you know, and there's not going to be a scenario where you always know if that's a bass or if that's a catfish, especially if you're just out there you know, roaming around out in the middle because you're going to be running, you're going to run by different types of fish. For me, like if it looks like a bass, like as far as giving that hard return and I throw a bait by it and it shows me any interest, like gives me a little energy towards my bait, I'm going to say, yeah, that's probably a bass. You mm -hmm. know, a lot of the trash fish, I mean, I have caught catfish too, jerk bait and stuff like that. <laughs> but but uh, a lot of the bass are going to exert at least a little bit of energy towards your bait and, and at least look at it. You know, they're not always going to bite it. But, um, and as far as crappie, um, for me, you've probably done the crappie a lot more than me, but, uh, uh I'm a bass guy. I, stink. I well, can't stand them little old jokers. For me, the crappie, <laughs> I see them more group. I mean, they get on stumps and stuff too, but when I'm just trolling around, just looking for roamers, it seems like the crappie are more like in a tighter group, even the white bass, like they'll be really tight together. And sometimes it'll look like one big fish, but it'll be three or four, you know, of them swimming around together. And, uh. The bass, I've I've noticed if you see like a little wolf pack of bass, four to six fish, they're not so close to each other. They just look like one big ball. Like they're they're a little bit spread out, spread out, and you know they're kind of swimming in the same direction, but not you know so close to each other, touching each other. The crappie seem like they're a lot smaller and just are so close to each other. You know that's mm -hmm. that's kind of my different. That's kind of how I you know tell what's what, but. Uh, it's still trial and error for me. Like I will straight cast at a catfish all the day. You know what I mean? I catch a big gar if that joker's big enough. I mean, uh, the, I was at Rayburn last year and I seen some in like eight to ten foot of water. You know, it was like f ten or twelve roamers just swimming around. I was like, that is bass for sure, and they were good ones. And I was getting them. They were following it too, and I was like, these are got to be bass. I don't know why I can't catch one. Finally, catch one catfish. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like it. I'm sure there's guys that can tell, you know, for sure that that is not a bass. But <coughs> I'm going to say 90% of the, you know, guys that are even good with live scope are still catching a trash fish every now and again. Mm -hmm. I say trash fish, catching something other than a bass. Right. Other than the target bass. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what I found on Garmin is it, it and it's because I haven't really done as much with the fish identification. I've been on Garmin, and it's, it's just what I do in terms of I've stuck to that brand, and so I know I've, I've learned the returns a little bit. A lot of times you can talk, like he was talking about, crop, crappie in themselves, they position themselves whether on cover, and, and they're vertical. I mean, when they get on a tree, they, like, stack on top of each other. They just like building blocks. Bass just kind of be out like he is. Yeah. Kind of mm -hmm. like bass. You know, it's like the boys. We don't get too close to each other. You know, you, you, they've got a little space – Crappie are like they like the girls. They go get up real tight where they can talk to each other. That's what I. That's when you see groups. That's kind of how I. But the actual return is what I found. Crappie or white perch, they have a real crisp return. There's not a lot of bouncing. The return is a tic tac or a circle, but it's usually a little oval. Looks like a tic tac. Well, it looks like rice. All but the time. bass are there are two different return bass. When it, it, I think it's because of that meaty chest, or I call it chest. Mm -hmm. When it hits there, you will see these little. You ever look at a light at night and you see that if you got astigmatism, you know what I'm talking about. It's got those little rays coming off of a light. When you look at a light straight on, it's got little rays. Mm -hmm. I think it's bass have a little ray. I call it a nebula. 
uh, it looks like a star almost. It'll have the circle, but you'll have those little bright returns above and below it. I think it's because when it hits, that return bounces really hard uh, off of there because it's so thick and meaty. Mm. And so it'll have like a star. It looks almost looks like a star on top of your Christmas tree. It'll have that center, but you'll have that that little nebula above and below it. And then big fish, to me, they look like a big – you'll see a fish, and the tail will be separated. It's It has like – Almost, it almost looks like a fish following a fish. Yeah. You'll see him, and every now and then you'll catch that full body together. But yeah. a big fish is so big in the front, I think he cuts the return off of the middle. You'll see a lot of little yeah. bass. You could see a little bass come up, and it looks just like a little bass swimming up yeah. there behind it. Mm-hmm. But when you see a big fish and it looks like there's a little one coming behind it, or you see a big turn, that's a big boy. That's mm-hmm. one of those eight, nine, yeah. ten pounders that you need to be working on. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask. And so I got a little story about that, but uh, and it's not a good story. But <laughs> what uh, is it? Five pounds when you start seeing tail separation? Six I, pounds? Seven pounds? What do I you think? I think you know anything four or bigger, you start seeing it. Yeah, it For depends me. on distance to me. Yeah, Dis- distance is a is a is a big deal. If you get out there, say 60, 70 feet, you're going to see it. But when he starts to get closer, where that big meaty chest and the head starts to block out the return of the fish behind it. And I think a lot of the reason you do it is because your bait naturally is climbing in the in the water column. And that fish is starting to ascend with him. So it, he's literally coming at the same angle of the rays. And so when you see that head, it blocks it out. And what you see is that tail kick out every now and then. And that's why it looks like two separate fish. You'll see that tail kick out because he's coming with it. He's looking. Mm. Smaller fish are so small that, you know, I mean, that ray is, he can't hide. There ain't nothing to cover up his tail. So you'll see a little fish swimming up through there. Yeah. But when you see that bigger fish, I'd say probably five, you know, I'd see like four or five pounds, just depending on the distance. Yeah. But those big ones, you ever see one out there, you see that head and that tail out there at 60, 70 feet? That's big boy. Bro, we had it. Yeah, get on one of them. <laughs> this song goes smiling ear to ear. He's like, I hate Nolan. We were fishing a tournament <laughs> last year at Darbone. And uh, actually, what spot? I think y'all you probably, know the, You probably know the brush pile. Yeah. And we were, <laughs> Tyler's smiling over there. <laughs> we were fishing this brush pile. And <clears throat> what I have, like a big, like an old monster worm? Uh, a 12 and a half inch old monster worm. Dude, we pulled that song gun up and it was like, 40, 50 feet, something mm-hmm. like that, maybe. And I mean, again, it looked like a watermelon with a little cantaloupe. Just a little, little rider. Yeah, <laughs> just a little rider. And I didn't know really what I was looking at. I mean, I knew a little bit just talking with y'all, tail separation and stuff, but not not on something like that. I'm telling you, it looked like a freaking watermelon you get from Uncle Fred at his back of a Chevrolet with a little cantaloupe. <laughs> it was massive. And uh, Nick's like, throw down there right now i mean it's like we're it's the waves are hammering everything else and it was just a lot going on we throw that dude down there was it the first or second time i think it was i think the first cast your worm fell off and i was holding it with the trolling motor trying yeah. to get you, and that's that's another point just a real quick little deal you don't always use it to scope a specific fish we were just looking at the brush pile yeah and we saw that fish and we were trying to get off we knew it was there so the second cast uh, dude that son of a gun it came like that like that little rabbit dog or whatever he was talking about earlier that dude he bolted or she whatever was bolted out of that and clearly we did not land it but i mean it lightning mcqueen came out of that brush pile and hammered it and of course i'm like i don't know what to do with my hands you know i don't even i didn't even know what to do and it Ricky hit Bobby. oh yeah exactly and dude i f- broke my dang ribs trying to set the hook on that son of a gun and fought it and fought it and fought it and never got out of the brush pile and she pulled and, him right back in mm. I had nightmares thinking about that. Hmm. Another thing for me, like, uh, you know, distance when you're trying to catch these fish, I know it doesn't, it seems like it doesn't matter as much. Like when you were talking, like you like to catch the ones that are sitting still. I like to sit still. The ones that are on like a specific piece of cover, maybe like standing timber or, or it might be a stump or, you know, brush piles. It doesn't seem like it matters as much. But like on those roamers, if they are 40 feet or less, can't catch them. You ain't catching them. Can't catch them. Really? Why? I don't know. I don't know if they can hear that frequency or you know what hear I the think? ping of the of the uh, you know the forward facing sonar, but they will not. I mean, you can still get them to sometimes follow it, but once they get close to the boat, you ain't catching them. Like my ideal, like I've got mine set on a hundred feet, and when I see that fish pop into my screen, I'm already casting at him. I think that. 40 to 60 foot range is like 
the premier, you know, ca- you know, where you want to catch one. Like, I'll, you know, if I see him at a hundred and I don't make a good cast, I'll try to get him. You can, you can make a pretty good cast at, because that that cone on the, you know, on a four face sonar, it gets wider the farther you go. So when you're casting at fish at a hundred feet, you might not actually be as close to him as you think you are. So, for me, is that right? Well, a hundred foot at a hundred foot, it's approximately thirty three feet wide. Right. So when you see a fish, uh, at say out there at hundred foot, he's a there's a thirty three, there's a yep. thirty three foot zone that he could be in, hmm. and I think and and you're right about that. I call it the hunt zone. Sixty to eighty is my hunt zone. Forty to sixty is my fishing zone. Zero to forty is no go. Yep. If it gets inside forty and he's roaming. You can just go on. Hmm. That, that I think, and I'm gonna say this. Remember when Papa used to tell you this back in the day? Boy, sit down. They can hear you talking. They can hear you. He's not lying. Take your foot next time you get out. Just just get above it and take your foot and go, and stomp it on the ground. Watch every fish in there. They'll they'll jump. Yeah. They'll do that out of the brush pile. They hear the. It's the boat. It's mm-hmm. the it's the it's the things going on in the boat. The live well running. You talking. I mean, I know y'all have done it back. Well, y'all might not have. I'm a little bit older than y'all. We, we, we. I was around four cell phones. Okay, come on now. But with can and string. I mean, yeah. you've seen it back. It tell it, it takes your your voice is going. Yeah. And when you're sitting there talking, it's going down that line. And your hands holding it. It's talking. It's going out. So when you get out there, 60, 80 feet, it's got a lot of time to dissipate. You get down there, 30, 40 feet. Not so much. They're hearing everything. You breathing, the radio going that you got going on. It's down in the water. I mean, I, I put your head under the water, crack your knuckles. It sounds like the world's coming. You know, I mean, you've been yeah. in a pool and do that. Mm-hmm. And it's not very loud here, but it sounds like, God, like you just broke your leg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's that 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 right there. It's the it's the the sound amplification goes further. And that's all live scope is. It's it's ultrasound. It's it's nothing more than what they use on the, a woman's stomach when they're looking at the baby. It's, it's, it's the same exact thing, except when they put gel on the woman's belly, the water is the gel. Mm-hmm. It's, it's what transmits the sounds and transmits through. It's, it's literally ultrasound. And, and it's, it, they're sending a sound wave out. And so if you know that, that the pinging, and you know how little, if you stick your hand on it, you can barely feel it. If they can hear that and feel that, they can hear you talking. And so that's why wow. distance is your friend. Mm-hmm. Stay out there. But another thing that I think is very important, as you talked about, the cone getting bigger. Don't get in a hurry. So many people see a fish and they, they got to get it out there. And they go, man, I read it right past him. And like you said, yeah, I read it right past him and I didn't catch him. Man, you're 33 feet away from him. You're dead on him where you need to be, but you're 33 feet. Take your transducer, your trolling motor, or your like a pole. I put mine on a live foot pole because I like to be able to use my spot lock. And scan back and forth and find that brightest <coughs> return. If you see a fish and, and don't just, you know, it's like a flashlight. And I equate this to a flashlight. Walk outside in the backyard with the flashlight tonight. That beam gets wider as it goes further out. So when you shine that flashlight, if you're up close, you can't see if something two foot to your left, that flashlight beam. But if you're out there, you can see 50 foot. Shine it back and forth, which is what you're doing with the live scope, until you find that optimal brightest return. Take you an extra two, three, four seconds. And then when you dial him in, you know that you're on him mm-hmm. as close as possible. And that's why, you know, make a couple casts. Cause, but if you make a cast and you say, oh, there's a return, you may be on this side of the beam and he's on that side of the beam, and buddy, he ain't even, he ain't even know you was there. Yeah. He well, that's know. the thing, like Tyler said earlier, I don't think I'm, people may know it. I did not. Fish, they will chase something down at 33 feet. Right. It, I can throw something. I can throw that glide bait or I can throw a jerk bait or something like that. And I used to think I need to get it on their nose. I mean, I need to scratch in between their eyes for them to, for them to notice it. No. Tyler started, he, you or Nick, one of y'all, probably both of y'all told me more times than I can count. You throw up above them, keep it above them, 8, 10, 12, 15 foot away, mm-hmm. they're coming to it. If they want it, they're coming to it. Right. Especially in the clean water. Yeah. I think in the clean water, the closer you get get it to them, you know, and the, and the better look they get out of it, the less chance. We were at, a, what was that, lake? And it was some lake in Georgia this year. Um, 
the water was super clean and we were catching spots and spots are aggressive oh. but if you got that bait within five feet of that spotted bass he'd look at it, he'd come up and look at it but he would not bite it so and a lot of those fish were close to the bottom so i was i was trying to keep that bait like 10 foot up and when they start exerting energy off the bottom like he said try to like almost get it away from them and speed it up and uh yeah, that's, you know, it was weird, but that's how you would catch them, you know, just keeping that bait away from them, not letting them, you know, get too good of a look at it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have your, I know you said, I know you do, I've seen it in your videos too, right. but me and you, we have our transducer on our uh, Ultrex. So I actually have it on the trolling motor as well. For me, it's a lot easier to hunt with it on the trolling motor. Yeah. If I was doing a crappie deal or, I, or, or, or something where I was just always spot locked, I could see where the pole would be more beneficial or, or even maybe doing one on the pole or or a turret and one on, you know, while you're hunting. That right. would be really good, too. I've just always I've just gotten so used to just having it on a trolling motor and just hunting with it. That's what I've uh, I've gotten used to. And, um, you know, like we talked about, you know, you've got the Garmin. I've got the active target. Um, the the Lowrance is pretty much plug and play. Yeah. Like. There's not much you have to do. Like someone that was just getting into it that um, really didn't know how to, you know, set up a unit hardly at all, can they can buy Lowrance mm-hmm. and plug that thing in. Really the only thing to mess with at all is your color palette and your contrast. For me, I run my contrast like on plus seven. It's like the highest I'll go. Just from zero to seven, depending on the water clarity or, or cloudy or whatever. But you can honestly leave that thing on zero and go catch fish with it anywhere. Yeah. And uh, that's that's one thing that I really like about it. Yeah. We have to tweak our garments some. You go in different types of water. You got to you to get that optimal clarity in in my opinion. Yeah. You you got to you got to tweak it just a little bit. Okay. But when I've when I go and I get that that LVS 34, when I get it dialed in, it's it's the best picture that I've seen. I want to throw something back to you about the the, the distance deal mm-hmm. before we leave there because it's been on my brain, boy. Come on. And he went, he went. And I was like, God, I want to get that in there. What I have done, and this is to help find something that's bright colored. Mm-hmm. It can be your lure dropper, you know, your lure, your lure, your lure knocker, uh, your a rig, whatever, whatever you you know may use. Drop it down in the water, and when you lose vision of it, let's say if you drop it down and you lose vision at five foot just about double it for how far you need to be away from that fish. So if you've got five foot of visibility in the water, remember the fish live there, they see better. You want to give them about 10. Like you was talking about, it's ultra clear. You can see down. You want to give them double the distance. If Mm. I lose visibility at a foot, I can get in that two foot range. Mm. If I lose visibility at two, I want to keep it three to four above their head. You want to keep it on the edge where he knows it's there because what you talk about, the number one thing is you want to I like a, I like a, I equate it to a big big dude sitting on the couch. There's all this food sitting in the refrigerator, and he ain't gonna go over and get him nothing. But if he gets up, he's gonna go, get, he gonna go get it. Mm-hmm. So if you can get them to exert a little energy and come, especially the bigger ones, if they ever come, they gonna get it. They're yeah. they're going. So you want to keep them just to the edge where it's, I gotta go get it. Because if you get it too far away or too close, he's like, eh, I can see it too good. Mm-hmm. But if he's too far away, I, I can't. So that's it. But uh, what we talk about, we, oh, the, you know, the settings. You're right. Lawrence is a more user friendly, user friendly type deal. Um, in a, in a way, that can be a good thing because you just you plug it up and you pretty much you go you go. But in terms of really dialing in a beautiful picture, I think that's where you go over to Garmin. And now, me. I played around with it for for a couple of year, you know, few years now, and I have come up with this kind of like this little ultimate settings, a little package of settings. And a matter of fact, I filmed a video today. Muddiest water you, I'm gonna tell you, so muddy you hit the trolling motor, you can see the the mud go away like that. It was bad. Golly, it was bad. And when you find that, I've kind of found this ultimate type, what I call like the ultimate settings, where I don't change it. Muddy water to clear water, I don't change. What I do do, what what I do, do what I do change is the color palette. Uh, you'll notice some color palettes show artifact far more than others. 
some some color palettes doesn't don't show a lot of artifacts. Some pa color palettes they show everything in the water from the waves on the water. So instead of when I found the the perfect what I call the perfect settings, I'll use the different color palettes to help clean up the picture as opposed to messing with my settings. You go to messing with settings, you can jack a whole lot of stuff up in a hurry, and you might not know how to get it back. But once you find those ultimate settings, start playing around with color palettes. Uh, if you're using, say, if you're uh, crappie fishing, you might want to use a blue color palette because it has uh, fish intensity show up as red. So it's easy to see a crappie into, in a brush pile. But if I'm fishing open water, I might use a rusted steel or amber because I see, you know, I'm not looking and trying to see in the brush. I'm just looking for those bright returns. So I don't need a lot of contrast. And so use those as opposed to messing with your settings as much. Try changing different color palettes. And that's for like for the guys who are just getting started. You know, so you don't go messing up your settings as much. Try using different color palettes as opposed to using different settings. Yeah. Is that what you always do first? So like if you go and it's looking a little bit bright, Instead of knocking the gain from 68 or 69 to 65%, yeah. Percent, yeah. you're going to go and change from, again, amber to black emerald or something like that? I don't use black emerald. emerald black emerald is the probably on, on Garmin. It's the one that everybody, because you can see it in the sunshine. Yeah. But I figured out a couple little tricks that uh, that that can help stuff in sunshine and not – uh, you don't have to use that palette because you can see everything on there. You can see your breath come off it when it comes off there. It's horrible for artifact. And if you go up to the on a Garmin, go up to the power button, push power, and it's going to be a nighttime mode and a daytime mode. If you turn it to nighttime mode, it changes the background of some of the color patterns, color palettes, and it will change some of them that are unusable and make them the best. Uh, and the way I figured it out, I got out there for daylight one morning. I was fishing for white perch, and it was a blue, and I was like, man, my blue ain't never looked like this. This is awesome. And then when it clicked over at sunrise, it flipped to the day pattern. I was like, whoa, what happened? And I was like, got it. And so I found a couple hidden color palettes, and I just switched mine to nighttime mode all the time. And I use the blue. It makes it, you know, use the blue, and it changes that color pattern from a light blue to a dark midnight or black and things change a little bit. So I found that to be the best for seeing in sunshine because you get that good, good contrast. That's why everybody likes black emeralds because you have a great right. contrast between the background, but you see so much artifact. And so I, I found that little trick, little tip, you know, just to you, find some extra color palettes that people didn't even know were there. You run nighttime all the, all time. the time. I just turn my contract, my brightness you never up turn on, it off. Never turn it off. Oh. I turn it on manual nighttime mode. And it's just, a, I've, showed a, I've showed a lot of guys that, and they go, I love blue. And I was like, switch it to that and watch how much you love blue. Yeah. What, what are your top three? For, I mean, for all water conditions, what are your top three palette ah, choices? That's, that's a good one. I'd like to hear it on yours, too. So cause. I've only used one. Literally, okay. on side scan, down scan, and four-facing sonar, I use the midnight blue. Oh, you love the midnight. It's, for side scan, I mean, Hummingbird made it. Yeah. They invented it. Is there anything better than that color blue, though? I mean, really? For me, no. You can just see the shadows so oh, good on no, that blue. No doubt. Um, I've tried the, you know, a lot of people run, was it lava red or whatever? or Lava. Lava or lava, whatever. Yeah. I don't really like that. And the brown is okay. Uh, what, 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 the what, brown was good on, was, yeah. yeah. But uh, but for me, you can just see the shadows, like especially when you're, you know, you're graphing and you're trying to side scan. When you're up in that shallow water and you're looking on side and you're really trying to see those fish, because a lot of times in like eight to ten foot of water you idle over them, on down that you already scared them, they're gone. Yeah. So for me, like when I'm idling shallow stuff, I'm running my side scan on like 80, 90 feet, and that uh, that blue uh, palette for me it just shows those shadows so good up there. Seeing fish on side scan. <laughs> I know they see it on the on the commercials and stuff. It's not as easy as people think it is. They don't just get out there and just have big flags above them. Right. You've got to have some really – and the shadows give it away more than the fish a lot yeah. of times. It's the shadows. It's that, it's that shadow that gives it away. But using that shadow, and you know this, you, looking at the shadow and then finding the fish, you can tell how far they're up off the bottom within a reasonable amount, especially on side skin and stuff like that. But mine may be a little different than his. See, I like I got three different color palettes I love. <clears throat> Amber is the one Livescope was made around. That's what they made it for. That's why they made it around. 
It shows the most detail. It's beautiful. You can see some of those really beautiful pictures. And the problem with that is when the sun gets up, it gets hard to see. It starts to, the sunlight coming in, it's the same color. It starts, stuff starts to blend. I use rusted steel because it, it has good contrast, good background. You can see it in the sunshine and, and, your, and your baits show up real well. And then I'll use the blue. Those are my top three for, for, for kind of, and the blue with the nighttime is more of my white perch. I, I love it because you can see those, those little big old white perch, they pop them little red balls, got little red interiors. When you see that strong red interior, you know, you're looking at a bigger fish because yeah. he's got that good dark return. Yeah. So that's something that's really, uh, but I think one thing I got to ask you, you, you got to give me a top five baits for fishing with live scope because it's different than everything else. What are your top five baits? So <laughs> for me, I really like uh, I really like throwing just like a three point three inch Kitek on like a quarter ounce ball head. Okay, all right. I love that. <laughs> they got a thing called a Saka Modishad. It looks like a fluke and a five inch. Um, I put that on a, f- a quarter ounce ball head as well. Okay, a quarter for me is just like very versatile. You can fish it shallow or deep. If it if they're really deep, I'll sometimes go to a three eighths. Or if they're just you know right under the water like schooling and stuff, um, I'll I'll run like a eight you know, an eighth sometimes or a 16th. But, um, you know, as far as, uh, that goes, those two are, 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 uh, my, probably my go-to. Then I'd go jerk bait for number three, okay. glide bait for number four. And you're not going to believe this, but I catch a lot of fish scoping with an old monster. Old monster. Yeah. So like, uh, you just know, throwing real. No, no. These are the ones that are on the bottom Okay. All or, right, or so. in piles and stuff. But, uh, you, know, you can you can talk to Nick about this. Like there was a lot of tournaments last year. We fished a we fished a pretty good bit in the summer, and um, we'd pull up on these places, and you would just see these fish just kind of yeah. swimming around on these points. They wouldn't be off the bottom if they were. They were only a foot off the bottom. Right. And right. Uh, you just throw a big worm on top of them, and you kind of see them kind of make a little move. You can't tell if they eat it or not because it's on the bottom, but you feel that thump, and then <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. Honestly, that doesn't go uh, go on year round. You know, for me, it's just like a summer deal, May through August. But uh, I really enjoy doing that. But as, as far as just taking off out in the middle, for me, like just a quarter ounce head with whether whether it be a Kitek swim bait or a fluke, you can cover any depth range. You know what I mean? Like whether, you know, you're in 40 foot or, or 10 foot, that's probably my go-to. If I just had to have one bait for scoping, it would be that. Yeah. Why do you use a ball head opposed to, say, uh, the, you know, like a six cents head, you know, with the, that are fish shaped heads or have that, you know, triangle type shape. Why do you use a ball head? I don't know. It's just honestly what I've always, what I started using, just got more confidence in it. Um, I know you would, you would think that the other shaped head with eyeballs and stuff would look more natural, but I've just had better luck with the ball head. I don't know if it's the way the bait acts with the ball head. I think it rolls what, more. It has might, a little bit better roll because it, of the rounded head. It must because, um, for me, and a lot of my roommates on tour, I mean, every one of us are just throwing straight ball heads with no eyeballs or anything on it. Just, And, and a lot of them aren't even painted. Just, good old gray yeah, leaded just, head. Just good old gray lead head, you know. And you can make them so easy. You can make, See, I make my own uh, swim baits. Uh, the little, you know, I make yeah. them. They're about three and a half inches long. They, they look like, you know, just like the little Strike King raid chads. Mm-hmm. Very similar to what you – Yeah. I, I throw that. But my my five, are little, they're a little bit different. A little bit different. See, I, I I do like I like an A rig. I know you can't throw it on tour. Yep, but I don't care. <laughs> I ain't on tour. That thing is bad. It gets I, me excited. God, I, sh- I love throwing it, but it shows up well on yeah. on, on live scope, and you get a reaction out of them one way or the other. Uh, I like the jerk bait. I like the glides. I like the big swim baits. Mm-hmm. The big swim baits, and then I throw the little bitty, uh, you know, just a little swim bait, just a little three and a half right. inch, and just throw it. And and that one is probably it's it's the best my my number one of course I love the A rig but if I had to choose one beside the A rig it's gonna be the little swim bait because you can throw it fast you can get it down you can work in a, it's a multiple it's a big time bait like sometimes on glide baits you gotta let it go down yeah mm-hmm. big swim baits it takes a while line throws it takes a while if you see a fish and that you know this they'll be at three foot and thirty in the same spot yep just roaming so you need a bait that you can go and cover those different depths very quickly and so i like you know the little swim bait it's and it ain't nothing more fun than catching a big one on a spinner rod yeah. yep. mm-hmm. what's, what's your favorite 
using your active target? Uh, right now, just like what he said, like a, a what we call a Demiki style, just you know, a ball head with like a fluke. This summer, I probably caught you know, hundred, two hundred fish on it. Maybe they didn't have a lot of size, but like they said, you can get it down to them so fast. So those roamers, whether it was schoolers on top or they were even over a pile. Yeah, I've had success just jigging it over a pile, and I can also catch crappie on it. Feel like I've learned a lot about fishing for crappie on that kind of style. So for right now, I'm just kind of learning with that. And uh, the glide, I mean, I haven't got it dialed in yet, but that's that one gets your blood going uh, yeah. big time. And then the lastly, the big worm uh, in a pile. You've turned me on to that. <laughs> let, let me tell you, fishing fishing that big worm. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like the big jelly worm, man. Come on. You know oh, yeah. what's crazy? What I what Fort Face and Sonar has taught me more than anything. So, like for the longest time, I was always graphing, looking for these big groups of fish, big schools, and um, you know I'd find these find these things, and uh, I might catch like a random big one out of them, but it mainly catching two to three pounders. What Four Face and Sonar has taught me, like you can pull up on like the most obvious looking point or hump on the lake where you think a big one would be where there might not necessarily be a school and troll around on it and you will see them like me and like all last year like I was catching giant bags you know and I was fishing the most obvious community hole stuff in the world I, that you know not necessarily at schools but I would pull up I'd troll around on the point and I'd see you know one or two cast at them with that big worm and then go to the next one no rhyme or reason. I, you know, sometimes I'd only catch one there and not catch another one there for four or five more trips. But, I mean, you could just jump from point to point and catch those fish when, you know, before Ford Face and Sonar, you just didn't know if those fish were there or not. Yeah. Well, speak, speaking of, like, catching fish and knowing if they're there or not, all three of y'all, if you had to go just say Caney or any just – no, not even Caney, a body of water that we just – God just struck and just made. It's just popped up right there. Y'all never fished it. You know nothing about it. You just know it has monster bass, and you're about to go win some money on it. If you use forward-facing sonar or you could use forward-facing sonar, just your maps, looking at contours, looking at topo-type maps, or looking at side scan, down imaging, we'll, we'll tie those three together. Which one are you choosing? If you've never been to this body of water water before, tournament angler, I just like to hunt big bass. Give me a live scope. You don't, you don't I don't hunt. even need the side image. Are we only picking one? Yeah, you only you can only pick one. I mean, if, if you're going and you have to put, you is have this to put your like a deep clear? Like, is it like a, it, there's a lot of variables? It, and I know it is. The point I was trying to make is, I get there's multiple points I was trying to make with that, but I guess really the main one. If I could just have one thing out of all of them, yeah. Much. Like, what what do you put? What do you put more confidence in? If you need to go catch fish, why are you putting more confidence in your? your it's top, top so maps? hard for me to choose between forward facing sonar and down scan because before forward facing sonar, I spent so much time looking at down scan and was pretty successful with it. Um, like for instance, if you go to the Tennessee River and they're in the summer and they're on the ledges. It would take a million years to troll looking for those schools with forward facing sonar. Right. But you could idle all day with down scan and find every school out there probably. Um, somewhere small like Caney, where you could troll the whole lake in a week. I would choose forward facing sonar. But so it's just kinda it was like the scenario. It would be yeah. it would it would have to depend on the scenario. Yeah. But uh I definitely if I had to take one off my boat and fish this year. Mm. I would probably go with Ford Face and Sonar because we got two smallmouth events this year, and that is such a game changer for smallmouth. I mean, if you see a smallmouth on that thing, he's biting. Talking about mm -hmm. your active target? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> oh, wow. <laughs> so that, that's that's <clears throat> that's the, you see the difference is what he's doing is he's thinking in terms of schools, tournament type fishing. I don't think like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go to Fork, and I go for one – I literally go for one fish. When I go to Lake Fork, I go for one fish. I literally – like I said, I've spent 10 times. I bet you burn $5 worth of gas. And that's just putting it on the trailer and backing it off. I back it down in the water. I might idle 100 yards, and I just go to looking in deep water. I just go to looking for them. And I might spend six hours finding one, but when I find him, that's, that's what – you know, that's, that's a difference in where he's trying to find the school. So it – where I don't even use side imaging. I don't even turn it on. 
I mean, I, I really do not turn it on on my boat. It might even be broke right now. I'd have to go look, <laughs> see if it's not glued up to the back of my boat. Yeah. I don't turn it on. Mm. It's just a difference in styles and difference in uh, – and I ain't got to never fish for smallmouth. I, you, I'm so jealous of that. Yeah. Golly. I'm so jealous of that. Yeah, so like, you know, like one in every 30 bat, largemouth bite when you're casting at them. Oh, gosh, yeah. So I'm going to say like two or <laughs> – Every other smallmouth you cast at bites. They're aggressive. I mean, they are so aggressive. I found them in Champlain last year. Believe it or not, I pulled up on a buoy. I was catching them. Just, I was running a pattern. I was just catching them off the rock piles off the buoys. Yeah. And uh, so I pull up. I catch one. And I, uh, while I'm messing around coaling or whatever, I drift off out in the middle of the river channel. Okay. I'm in like 100 foot of water. <laughs> all right. And I stand back up. And the current was so strong, I realize I'm like 100 yards away from that buoy. So I'm like trolling back to the buoy and I'm in super deep water. Well, I just see a fish out there and this thing is in like 20 foot of water, oh, sitting over a hundred foot of water or however, it could have been 60 foot of water. It was just deep. That's all I remember. My live scope wasn't set deep enough to see the bottom. And, uh, so I toss a drop shot out there and I see it going down. And then all of a sudden, all I see is the, the fish swims over there, gets it. And then I just see the weight hanging under the fish with a drop hmm. shot oh and gosh. then next thing i know i look over here to the right there's another one and then i catch him and then i end up catching like 10 or 12 just out there in the middle of nowhere and every one of them were over four pounds and uh wow. in that tournament i i had like two you know 21 22 pound bet days off something i found on accident with fa forward facing sonar that i'd never found with anything else and then um Another thing that's tough about Fort Face Sonar, that last day the wind was absolutely crushing. And uh, so we were dealing with like three foot waves in my trolling motor. I couldn't keep it in the water there the fourth day or the third day. And, uh, mm. you know, that gets thrown out the window when you can't keep your trolling motor in the water. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I can see it's, it's, that you, having to use the spot lock, that's where kind of, and it's still coming out of the water, but. That's where having a turret or yeah. pole on there is really right. Uh, that's where it comes in handy. That's why I like to use my spot lock so much. Is because life I, if I get in an area where there's like a fork, there's so much timber, so there's so much to look at, and yeah. I just hit the spot lock. You know, and fishing into the wind. Mo that's most very important. A lot of people, you know, fishing in the wind's always been something, right? But it's even more important with live scope or or you know active yeah. target for you know, and I'll pull up. And I'll scan, and I'll work real. You know, I'm looking at each tree, each little thing. And when I, if I don't see anything, I'm gonna pull up 20 feet and look again, because the angles change and they're hid behind them. And when Live Scope first came out, it wasn't designed to go on the trolling motor. You didn't get a trolling motor mount with it when they first brought it. You had a in the first few packages. You know, when they until they realized what they had, they didn't know what they had. They it, they came with a boat mount. It oh, came really? with a, a mount to mount it to the back of your boat. <clears throat> that's what it first originally came with. Made a full circle there. And and then it went to people started using it on trolling because they could see and they start people started adapting it. But it originally was made to mount on the back of a boat. That is where because if you look at some of the uh, the earlier videos and stuff like that, you'll see it on the back of the boat. And look at some of the earlier instruction manuals, you'll see it. Uh, they talk about, you know, use the boat mount and stuff like that. Not maybe pointing it out to the sides, but essentially using it like down imaging or down scan mode, but a live down scan. Yeah. And then it became, people started adapting and then Garmin realized what they had. Uh, Took off from there. So yeah, that's, that's something that, you know, it's, the people didn't realize that's what it originally. So I saw it and I was like... Y'all just bring it back what they originally thought about yeah. it in the first place. Things, stuff works out like that a lot with with anything. Yeah, stuff it, it picks it has its trends and it'll pick right back up. But like I was saying, me and I know me and you, we don't fish for a living. We don't have a huge YouTube channel. We don't do this for a living. I drink monsters every day. We're weekend <laughs> warriors. We're gonna fish Saturdays, Sundays before church, that kind of stuff. What I'm going to talk on the Garmin. So what is a weekend warrior set up? Because it's expensive. Like the Garmin stuff is not cheap. So if I'm coming in and I have a fit of like my boat, I have a Express XP 180 and I'm going, I want something that we can duck hunt in the morning out of. Right. I can deer hunt tomorrow evening out of. And then another day I can go fishing out of. So what is going to be the best setup for me when it comes to a Garmin setup? 
for for the weekend warrior. Yeah, because most of your people are yeah. weekend warriors. Yeah. Most people most they people, work during most the week. people are going to be. It's expensive. There's, I mean, it's sixteen or twelve ninety nine, whatever they are now for the the transducer in the black box. Yeah, I think it's like sixteen hundred bucks. You're gonna have you're three looking, to four grand depending looking on what at you get. Twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. And if you want to, if you want to, you need to test the waters because this ain't for everybody. This is not for everybody because the coolness wears off in about five minutes. It, it wears off in it very quickly when yeah. you don't catch a fish when you realize that you just don't drop it down in the water and go catch a fish. So. You don't do like some people spend three, four, five, six thousand dollars, and you go, I got to sell it because it ain't worth but about half on the way out. Start with like a 93, which is a nine inch unit, 93 UHD or UHD2, um, and get you a 34. And the transducer. LVS 34. Yeah. Yeah. And then and the transducer will go up. But if you're a crappie guy, if you're a crappie guy, white perch guy, you can find the LVS 32, which a lot of pros still prefer. Uh, I don't know why. I've I've seen it. It's too much. It's more way. It's not near as good, but people still like it. I don't know why. But a lot of the crappie guys love it. Uh, they say that the fish size translates better, but I don't know. But you can find a good used LVS thirty two for five or six hundred bucks. Sometimes even cheaper than that. If you get a guy who just got a couple thirty fours and wants to get a little bit of his money back for his wife, beats him upside the head. And a 93, you can get into them for a thousand bucks for a whole unit if you look for the right places to buy something used. But if you're going to go up, you want to, you're going to find that the processors in these units is truly you get what you pay for. You yeah. Know? And I don't know the all the uh, the different levels in Lawrence. I'm not as familiar, but like there's a difference between Echo Map and GPS Map. Their Echo Map is more of your your weekend warrior type guys. I know that you see it on pros boats. That's because Garmin says, here, put that on your boat. And the, and the reason Garmin told me that was the guy who buys a GPS map doesn't need convincing. He's got that money. He don't need, you don't need to convince him. But the guy who's got the Echo map may say, man, I want what that pro has, and it's attainable. Yeah. And see. And so it still gets the job done. It gets the job done. Yeah. But when you get into GPS maps, you're getting a faster processor. You're getting a little bit, a lot more crisp screens. Uh, the pixel ratios are going to be about the same. It just is a brighter, more vivid picture, and you find you'll find yourself seeing that better target separation and things like that. Now, Lawrence has got boy, they got HDS, HDS Lives. They got thirty-seven different. They confuse me with what they got, but they have a nice system too. They have a real nice system. Yeah, as far as uh, you know, Weekend Warrior and Lawrence. Um, I mean, you can get a really good picture with any of the HDS units and even some of the, you know, the lower end units as well. Um, you know, I would highly recommend trying to get, you know, an HDS, you know, the, the lives are like the last year's model, you know, as far as, you know, affordability, they're going to be cheaper than the new pros. And uh, as far as active target one or two, I would say the two is a little more crisper, you know, on the bottom, but you can catch plenty of fish with the one. I mean, Nick's got the one and he catches them with it just fine. Um, so I don't think, I mean, as long as you have an active target one or two, I don't think it really matters too much what, you know, which unit you put it on. I haven't had any experience with like the, the hook units or the elite units. I don't know uh, about the compatibility with them and uh, active target, but um, as far as like the lives and the pros and, you know, all that stuff, um, I haven't had any issues out of any of them. So um, and, and even with the smaller screens as well, like the nines, you know, you can, you can see just fine with them. So I've ran, you know, I've been running 12s over the last couple of years in the, the last two years I've ran 16s. But, um, for me, just the bigger picture, I'm blind in one eye, so I can barely see as it is. I just, it's just easier for me to see, but, yeah. um, I have no issues, you know, with even the smaller ones. Like I said, the nine inches. Yeah. Do you see a difference between running a 12 inch versus a 10 inch graph? Yeah, on, I, on clarity, because that's one thing you, yeah. you see every forum. They talk it up. Everybody says I want to use I want to use the biggest screen that I can afford. I want to use the biggest screen I can afford. Uh, I've I've recently switched to something a little different, uh, which is and it's coming. I, I see a lot of the pros. Um, NBT, mm -hmm. um, NBT is, is, that is that the big one. Yeah, make the I, got, inch. I got I got a twenty two inch battleship. <laughs> I had two units up front. I had two twelve. That's 12s. awesome. I had two twelves. Right. And then I have one at the console. And then, but I would find, because I, what I do is I run one perspective. We could talk about this in another deal. I run one perspective and one forward all the time, uh, especially when you're out chasing. It is awesome for finding schools of shad fast because you can see that 
135 degree cone and you can find shad and then turn right to them. Whereas turning a forward back and forth looking, it, take, it takes a little while. You're scanning, it takes a lot of effort. You know, your leg be wore slap out. But I'll find the schools of bait fish on the forward and then line it, I mean, on the perspective, then line it up. But I found that when I was doing that, you're looking up, down, up, down, up, down. And it, I don't know about you. You get iPhone neck. <laughs> Livescope neck's about as bad, too, after a day. It, it'll wear you out. Your yeah. neck, you feel like you've been in a car wreck. You ride home the whole day trying to stretch your neck mm -hmm. over the back. And so I went to that unit, and it it piggybacks off of my 1243. So I just got my 1243 at my console, and I got one 22-inch up front. And you think, man, that's 22 inches. Well, you got two 12s. Mm -hmm. It's actually smaller in space because it's it's side to side. And it's actually like an 8616. This is no joke. I think they're like $6,000. Yeah, so they're it's, expensive. But you can put a 1243, which is, you can find a you can find one used or buy it at a store for less than like 2500 bucks, which still ain't cheap. But And then put that one on there. It's 22 inches, and it's half the price of an 8616. Mm -hmm. Half the price. And it runs off of, and you want to talk about fun, especially when you're crappie fishing. You out there, you got it at 30 feet. And you got literally ten foot section is represented by seven inches of screen. Yeah, that's that awesome. is it is so much fun, son. You can see that you can see that little road runner spinning down there. You can read road runner on that thing. Are you uh, are you running two sixteens? Uh, so I ran three sixteens last year. I ran one in the console and two up front. But um, this year I haven't really decided what I'm going to do yet. Um, I've still got my two sixteens from my last year's boat. I'm going to put on there. And then, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'll end up adding another one again or just run the two. Because with the 16, I can make them, I can shrink down the map right. and still kind of see what's going on. And still have a big screen for active target. So, yeah. Nice. Nice. Well, I know we need to talk about perspective. I, uh, I think I want to save that for another episode. Boys, we're it's we're an, we're an hour and a half in. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I didn't even realize. It's, I looked down. I was like, by, my wife's like, I got food for you oh, at home. I, oh, <laughs> I have my phone. I keep looking at it. We all kind of keep looking at our phone. Like our wives are texting. That's us. what she it's said. I went. I went and eat. Do you want me to pick something up? Yeah. And I was sneaking a text in there. Yeah, it is. Uh, well, my phone. I got my timer on that. It is six thirty-five yeah. on a Friday night, and I'm sure all of our wives are not super happy. I have mine on Do Not Disturb, and my. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I th they all know what we're doing, yep. but, uh, well. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think we, we do appreciate all of y'all listening and we, there's a lot of good information. This is not going to be the last time. I thank y'all for coming all on. Right. Um, I do want to get a, if, if each one of y'all last little, last little takeaway oh, for yeah. when it comes to live scope, um, really pushing for not even the naysayer, but just, just a beginner because that's where most people fall into the category is is the beginner right. or even if you've been you've been having a live scope since the 32s first came out you're still trying to get it down and you're still trying to get it dialed and so uh I, we're definitely going to plug your channel in a second and then tyler we, you, you yeah. offer some really good information as well and nick you do too you don't have a million people following you but the, <laughs> the content that you put out and stuff is, is good as well so uh but well, last little takeaway for kind of the noob Hmm. live scope or someone looking to get better let's just say that someone wanting to get better at live scope right what's the little takeaway you got i tell you what it's in fish behavior i think that i've learned more in the past two years about fish behavior than i ever thought and so you need to be very open-minded when you when you go when you use a live scope be open-minded uh, and I, real quick is like remember when we first started fishing about a tree you thought, man, in my brain, I thought a fish just butted up against a cypress tree mm -hmm. and he sat there looking. And then when I got live scope, I realized that joker never stopped swimming. He's yeah. all around the tree. Mm -hmm. He's moving in. He's out. So a lot of times you throw up a tree and you don't catch one. You, you've, you've heard the old say, it's left, front, right, move on. Man, I threw up trees 10, 15, 20 times, but the fish would always be moving and I'd, he'd never see it. And then finally you'd line it up. So be open-minded and trust what you're seeing. That's very hard. That's yeah. my little take. Yeah. What you got, Nick? Uh, my takeaway so far, like I say, my experience is very limited right now, but it's just, for me, it's just a lot of fun. It's something I could take my wife out, my future kid out, and they not knowing much about fishing. And, you know, if I'm fishing the bank, I'm going to be able to cast a little better than them. But if I have a, if, you know, if I'm sitting in one spot live scoping and there's a, you know, brush pile full of crappie, um, it's, it's easier for them to see it and they play games on their phone 
you know so it's it's like it's almost like playing a video game people call it video game fishing and for me the takeaway it's just a lot of fun go out there have fun with it you know don't take it too serious you know your teenage kids they could probably do it better than you can so yeah. just go have fun with it yeah what you uh, got? for me i'm just time on the water time messing with it i mean you're not going to learn it in one or two trips or even five or ten trips i mean this is something that you're really going to have to spend some time looking at and just you know be patient with it because like like he's mentioned you go out there and you don't start catching fish immediately and you get all upset about it but it's it just takes time and honestly i would recommend going with somebody that knows how to use it first and uh you know let them show you kind of what they know about it maybe catch a few fish on it because that's the biggest deal is um you know back when i got it there wasn't a whole lot of people around here to kind of show me how to catch them or like the things about like trying to keep the bait away from them so i spent a lot of trial and error messing with it so i would just recommend you know trying to get with someone you know maybe going on a guy trip with me there you go. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm talking about. I mean, both, both yeah. of y'all, y'all both have y'all both. Mine's have those totally off. different than his. So, so I just deal with electronics. I, I deal with dialing in your units, making sure that you you know you got them. Can't tell you how many people show up with it, and it's pointing backwards. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Making sure you got it set up, unit. Making sure that you've got you know the the detail, and then kind of teaching you about the settings. Whereas he may be able to go into a little bit deeper, show you how to catch those fish with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's two different things. Still very, you know, very yeah, valuable you, you depending need, on what you need. You need both. I'm going to hit you up, and we're going to go out, Absolutely. and I'm going to make sure that mine's good. Yeah. And then, uh, and then Tyler, I'm going <laughs> to bum off you like I always do. And we're Shoot, I'm hiding there. with you. We're going to freaking smash them, baby. But uh, I'm going to throw my phone in the back of his boat there with the with put the, the air old, tag. With the, now I'm going to put the old active captain on. Let it trace my. Oh yeah. Tra- well, he's been sitting in that circle for a little That's while. A long time. That's why I told him earlier. I said, uh, I'm going to slip out there. Tell you my stomach hurts. Go. I got to use back bathroom and i'm gonna go slip a card a memory card in his unit oh no, man download. just turn on your app and just let it follow the trails <laughs> and boy he, we've been going in a circle here quite a bit you know reaching your pocket and hit waypoint real quick mm-hmm. you know go out there blindfolded uh all right tell us you're uh i mean people want to look into you they want to watch your videos i'm not saying if they want to you want to watch his videos you <laughs> want to check them out right. like i said earlier with the very utmost respect, this is live scope of a vast majority. You go into details and you explain a lot of stuff. Right. But I got into watching your videos, not even knowing you lived 45 minutes away from me. Right. I had no clue. And I watched your stuff over at Masterclass. I can't tell you how many times I've watched. I sat there for two hours. Right. may have broken it up, but I can't tell you how many times I've watched that thing. But yeah. it's live scope for dummies. And so how can they get in touch with you or watch your YouTube videos? Well, just Garmin Guru. And you just type G-U-R-U. in Garmin Are you? Guru. It's got two G's, kind of like the hat here. Uh, it's Garmin Guru. It's got it on Facebook, and they've got it on YouTube. And I, you know, it's a lot. You know, on the, if you inbox me on Facebook or, or message, I return. I answer pretty much every question. It gets sometimes it gets a little crazy. I get hundreds of messages daily. Matter of fact, you can see them right there. Somebody <laughs> did ask somebody. You know, somebody putting a message in right there for me, and it's it's constant. But I try my best to answer. Yeah. And the, and you set up the little trips with me and things like that. But but I I don't I don't you know I don't a lot of times I I've, I've I've taught myself out of trips because somebody will want a trip and I'll say look you don't need it just talk to me over the phone and I I've answered them phone calls my wife's like you gotta stut shut it off stop yeah <coughs> yeah well it's good that you're being honest with the people though but I can tell you like me. I don't want you to explain to me over right. the phone. Same thing with school. I do right. way better on that chemistry test or whatever it is if you're showing me firsthand. And right. that's how with the live scope is. I want you to show me how to use it in my boat, not in yours. That's what I want. I want before I get off, I gotta say hi to my my wife. Come on. My son, Drake, and my little girl. Okay, uh, Sophie. So I wanna say hi to them three because I told him I told him a little man, I wanted to mention him, but We'll mention him in the perspective. I'm going to show you how it's good for kids, too. That's a good, yeah. good deal. for pers- Perspective is so much fun for kids. Yeah. Awesome. Before we hit before we hit our driveways home tonight, we'll all have a date picked out for another one. Oh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back in, be back in here very, very soon. Yeah. So uh, Garmin Guru, check him out. Do you have an Instagram? Oh, yeah, I got one. It's Garmin Guru, too. Okay. So Everything's all, Garmin all plat- Guru. Yeah. All platforms, Garmin Guru, Garmin G-U-R-U. Guru. You can't miss it. Yeah, yep. check him out. And uh, thank you for coming on, Tyler. Gosh, I had a blast. They're uh, they're going to book with him, and then 
once they get it all dialed and they get that they get that confidence built, they're going to come with you because <laughs> I'm coming with you. I'm ready. How much yeah. is a trip? How much? Is uh, a trip? So for a half day, I do three fifty and full day five hundred. Yeah. So. We bring in rides. We got to use yours. Yeah, I I provide everything. You can bring your own stuff Come if you on want, now. but uh, just show up. Okay. All right. So what? Uh, how how do they get in contact with you on that? So uh, Facebook's probably the easiest thing. You can just you know type in Tyler Stewart Fishing, and you can find me on Facebook. Um, also, I have Instagram. My handle on there is tstu99. You can message me on there as well. Um, but uh, that's pretty much primarily how the best way to get in touch with me. Okay. And so. do, you, do you do trips all over? You just, I mean, I know you're a lot at Caney. I mainly focus on Caney. I live right by Claiborne, too. So I'll do a few on Claiborne every now and again. But mm-hmm. uh, most most people, when they come, they want to go to Caney. If they want to have, if they know what they're talking about when it comes to you fishing, they want to go to Caney. Yeah. It's, you get on them. When I see those pictures pop up of what you're holding, I'm like, oh, it looks like I'm looking at like Ben Milliken or something like that. I'm like, who <laughs> is this cat hammering? I heard, I heard you say a couple of years ago that you believe Caney was the, Matter of fact, when it was B, BPT was here, yeah, and you said it was the best lake in the country. It is. Still believe it? It's still the best lake. There's not another lake in the entire world where you can go and consistently catch seven, eight, nine pound bass. I mean, I had two buddies come in from um, uh, Gray Buck, who's one of me fishes the Bass Pro Tour, John Hunter, and a couple of other buddies uh, came in last night and stayed with me. This morning, Gray went out and. Uh, Said he hooked the biggest bass of his life. He caught a seven pounder, a couple six pounders. He's like, dude, this is the biggest. Like, never been to a lake in my life where you catch this kind of quality of fish. Now they're not easy to catch. They are extremely educated because it's a small lake. It's only a five thousand acre lake. Right. But for being that small and have that many big fish in it, it's just incredible. I've never been. I've been all over the country and I haven't seen anything like it. I mean, I fished Okeechobee. I mean, that lake is huge. I'm sure there's way more big ones in there, but they're just they're so confined at Caney. So. The likeliness of you catching one, you know, if you spend a little time out there, is pretty big. So you think it's better in Fork and Ivy? I don't know. I've never been to Ivy, but I think if you put your best guy on Fork and had it put him against the best guy on Caney and gave him three days, the guy on Caney is going to catch more fish over seven, eight pounds than the guy on Fork. I personally believe that. What do you oh, think, Nick? I think so. Even Ivy, just a little bit I've heard. I've, I've also never been there. I'm but a Fork guy. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm I'm a, I'm Mother Fork. I believe in Mother Fork now. <laughs> but no, it just seems like Ivy. You're just going out there to hunt one fish, and they say it's a thousand boats out there every day, and yeah. not nine hundred and ninety eight of them don't even catch a bass. Yeah. So yeah, I believe that as well. Hmm. Mm, we, we got, got some, some we got, we got stuff some good stuff on. going here. This yeah, Fork Caney battle, man. Yeah. We need to throw down there. We'll hold, we'll hold that and maybe, the perspective. Maybe we can do a YouTube. Uh, oh, Caney was... versus Fork. Me and Nick against uh, you, you guys, and see 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 who who catches more. <laughs> you bigger. lost. He I'm just like... <laughs> he he threw you up under the bus. He, he threw you threw the me. scraps. I just, I just lost right off the bat. <laughs> no, Joe. He ain't fish with I me got... before, and he already knows he lost. See, I like I like the night fish fork. That's no, what we can do a night fish. No, I, I love the <laughs> night fish Caney too now. I love me some night I'm not night fishing here. against y'all two on Caney. I don't care. I'll have this a right here, We only need ball. about 20 minutes on <laughs> one spot about an hour before dark. Don't we and do? we're going to drop it. that pin. Are you dropping that pin? Yeah, that's we got our phones here. turned off. That day. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to charge them. <laughs> You're sick. Oh, well, good deal. Guys, thank y'all so much. I appreciate you listening to this. That was awesome. That was awesome. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys. <laughs>